This is Unit 6, Ethics, Economics, and the Environment. I'm going to start off with Lecture 21. This is the last unit in the Introduction to Environmental Science, South Florida State College. 21 is this lecture, Hazardous and Solid Wastes with Sustainable Solutions. 22 includes uh, sustainable economic development. Get excited about that. My voice kind of goes up. 23 is environmental ethics, the foundation of sustainable society. And 24 is law, government, and society. But today, for Flex Lecture, we're focusing on hazardous and solid wastes. Sustainable solutions. Well, that's a lot of S's. <laughs> All right. I'm going to talk about what our waste stream is. What's a waste stream? Uh, not like a river or something like that. Sanitary landfills and their alternatives. Why is ocean dumping a problem? I should say still a problem. Problem, problem, problem. It is. And the three R's of waste reduction. The big R, the most important. Well, three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. But one of those is the one that makes the most sense. Well, maybe they all make sense. Turning biomass waste into natural gas, toxic and hazardous waste. How do we dispose of them? Our remediation is that a real thing? And Superfund, what is it and has it done any good? Well, I'll answer all those questions, but this will address some of them. Interesting quote from the founder and director of Zero Waste America. We are living in a false economy where the price of goods and services does not include the cost of waste and production. This has been true for many years, a hundred years at least. Uh, perhaps more than that. But the price of goods and services does not, do not include what it costs in terms of waste and pollution, particularly to the environment. So where does our solid waste go? Now, curiously enough, if you happen to live in the city of Avon Park, Florida, uh, your solid waste doesn't go, Avon Park being in Highlands County, it doesn't go in the Highlands County Class Lead 3 landfill. Well, that's a pixelated picture, isn't it? That's actually a bunch of landfill waste. You'll have to trust me on that one. Uh, work on that picture. Um, where it ends up is in somebody else's landfill because, uh, well, politics actually. But our county does have a Class 3 landfill. Two versions of one of the three R's, which is actually the recycling. Um, we're about to have curbside recycling in this small community. We're going to stop having to haul our uh, stuff to these bins and they're going to stop by and pick it up every once a week morning. The other R is uh, not unique to here, but uh, uh, these are all old tires being disposed of. And you can see, actually, if you look down this line, there's a line of cars there. <laughs> um, this was taken, um, I'm not sure who took this picture, but uh, we've uh, started actually cleaning up our county by having people, paying people uh, $2 per tire for every tire they bring in. They bring them in uh, twice a year. Uh, these happen in the spring and in the fall. And uh, so if you happen to be looking for, uh, I think you can make up to 50 bucks, they'll accept 25 tires at a time. Believe me, it's, it's a lot of work. I, I did it uh, one time. I, I thought, oh, this would be easy. There are tires all over the place. Well, uh, for this particular, the first event, uh, people had gone out and scoured the county and you couldn't find these things. I drove 50 miles, I think, and I found 17 big tires and uh, took my $34 and, after standing in line for uh, five hours. It's a great story. <laughs> Waste-free cities. That sounds like a great thing. So do we ever think about garbage? We don't try to think about garbage. We try not to. But historically, uh, that's what these guys are doing. They're sifting through the garbage of, of millennia ago. That's where we find our archaeological treasures today, is because we simply dump our stuff. So there is a waste-free city that's been established, or they're trying to establish it, in Kirstenstad. I think that's how you say that. Their focus is on reuse. They have... Uh, uh, all of these waste streams going into a central production. Now, Kirstenstadt is, is not in, in North America. It's actually in Sweden. 
20 years ago, they were out of space in their landfill. Instead of trying to increase their landfills, the city actually built a methane production plant. So biogas, methane production, they now sell that methane. I'm getting ahead of myself in my points. Biogas produces fuel you can use in heating homes. Uh, put it in cars, actually. It's an interesting thing. So all of their waste actually ends up in this plant. Methane from cows, all that stuff. And it's turned into biogas. And then that residue, whatever's left over, goes back to the farm. Recycling. Now their waste, it used to just be waste, now people pay them for it. Of course it takes some doing, you do have to process it, but uh, it's not a bad thought. So what waste do we actually produce? According to the US EPA, we produce 11 billion, with a B, tons of solid waste each year. Uh, industrial waste, other than mining and mineral production, amounts to 400 million metric tons, so that's uh, uh, in the United States per year. Uh, now you see this line, this is uh, uh, from 2010, I think these numbers are more updated now. Uh, the top there, we have gone from about, what's that, 88 uh, million tons of waste produced in 1960 per year, uh, up to 250 million metric tons uh, in 2010. And the blue line here is actually waste generated per person, per capita in other words. So pounds per person per day in 1960 was 2.7 pounds per person a day. Now the waste stream has increased, what's that, threefold? But the per person per capita per day, the, the per capita stuff, has only, well it's not quite doubled uh, to 4.4 in 2010. Uh, today it's or about five years later, about 3.6 tons per person per year. Okay, that's per, per day, per year, get them right. Uh, why has that number dropped? Well, our population has increased from about 150 million people in 1960 to 300 million people plus today. So we, though we've doubled our, we have reduced our waste stream, so it's a good sign. There's a good thing going on there. So there's good news and there's bad news in that solid waste removal thing. So we have on this, this graph here, uh, the red line is uh, total recycled. The red line goes up there from, once again, 1960 to 2010. We went from 6% of everything we produced was recycled in 1960 to, I'm sorry, millions of tons recycled. Back that up. 6 million tons recycled per year in 1960 to 85 million tons, that's a lot, uh, per year in uh, uh, 2010. Municipal solid waste is garbage we produce in our houses, offices, cities, wherever it's coming from, that's what it is. It accounts for a small percentage of the total amount of waste. Reuse and recycling is hard, and waste contains a lot of different materials. And it's not kept pace with the total amount of, uh, so we, we started out with, again, about 6% of our total waste generated was recycled. It's only going up to 34% of the total amount of waste generated. 34% is recycled now. So the waste stream is everything we throw away. And this is a 1988 report from the US EPA. Um, most of what we recycle there is paper. Uh, the waste stream, that's that steady flow of waste, varied waste that we produce. Domestic garbage is included, yard waste is included, all that industrial, commercial, and construction refuse, that's all part of our waste stream. And if we were able to separate that from the, the, the uh, banana peels and the, the onions and the, the uh, other little things we throw in the garbage, it would be valuable commodity like paper. Uh, yard waste is certainly compost, com compostable, say it right. Um, food waste, we don't recycle a lot of food waste. It's hard to do that. Uh, glass used to be the thing, hey, we're going to recycle lots and lots of glass. Well, it hasn't really worked out that way. In fact, with the new 
uh, waste, uh, the uh, recycling program that's coming online in, in this little county, uh, it, they're not going to accept glass. Uh, metal is still a big thing. Plastics are still being recycled, and I'm surprised. Uh, well, there's metal. Metal's on there as well. Um, metal is, is a higher value commodity because it's easy to recycle that. Rarely do we separate out our garbage. We, rare, we usually mix it all together. Uh, methods for collection make it easier. It's easier just to dump it all in the can rather than having to sort it out. So, we need to change some things. So what's in this waste stream? Looking at it, the top is the amount generated by weight. The bottom graph is how we dispose of it. And there's, you would guess that you know, most of our waste is paper. That makes up most of the weight of it, the vast majority of it. Um, wood, plastics, textiles, you can, you can see that. Most of it, we landfill it. <laughs> we stick it in the ground. 26% uh, is recycled. Uh, some is composted and some is incinerated, but that makes up most of it. We bury it in the ground. Organic materials, yard, garden, food, food waste, sewage sludge. Junk cars, worn out furniture, consumer products. I have a trailer full of old, actually, gas grills that have worn out without the tanks on them. I need to take those and get them recycled because that will work. Newspapers, magazines, packaging ads, paper, all that stuff is in the stream. And uh, it's not something that we see much in this country, but this is actually a, a, a family digging through garbage. I think this is uh, uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Those open dumps are still the mostly the main way that the developing world disposes of their waste. They don't landfill it, they just dump it. Most developed countries, as in Europe, United States, Japan, forbid open dumping, at least in urban areas, at least in, because there's plenty of evidence of dumping if you go out in some rural parts of, the, of this country. Illegal dumping is still a problem. And much of the trash washes into sewers, says into the ocean, but it stops in the lakes first. Illegally dumped garbage often includes toxic chemicals that show up in the groundwater. That's not a random thing. This is still a crisis in the developing world. Mexico City generates 10,000 tons of trash per day. That's 10,000 tons. That's a lot of waste. And a lot of it ends up not being taken care of. It goes through all these baskets you see sitting around here or uh, recyclers who are coming through this garbage and uh, finding valuable stuff or recyclable stuff. And this is actually in Manila, in the Philippines. This is a thing called the Smoky Mountain. It's what it's called. Uh, 50 meters high pile of gar garbage up to 25 is huge. 25,000 people live and work in this environment in Manila. And then you have, this is actually, I had a, a class that they said, what is that, Mr. Ford? And I said, well, that's poo. That's the polite word for it. That's stuff coming out of a pipe. Ocean dumping is mostly uncontrolled when it comes down to it. Every year, 250, no, I'm sorry, 25,000 metric tons, 55 million pounds of packaging, bottles, cans, plastic containers are dumped in the sea. We had a, uh, uh, an assignment about, or maybe we have one in this unit, I forget, <laughs> I lose track of things, assignment that, uh, the, uh, about the garbage patch uh, out in the ocean. That's where it comes from. Even remote regions, beaches are littered with, in fact, that's mostly where they're found, is in these remote areas. Uh, this is not so remote. This is off New York City. NYC is right here. And the Hudson Valley Shelf. Uh, it's a bit of an exaggerated scale, but nevertheless. About 150,000 tons of fishing gear. 1,000 kilometers of nets are lost or discarded every year in the ocean. A program that, that allows you to recycle that, some of that stuff, but still, that's a lot of stuff. Till recently, till 1992 in New York City, many cities in the United States simply took 
their waste and dumped it out here in the ocean. Dumped their municipal refuge, industrial waste, sewage and sewage sludge into the ocean. It's now illegal to do that, but how many years did we do it? This is one of those remote shorelines that is polluted with, that's all just garbage that's washed up on shore, up on the, the, uh, the, the shoreline of, of some remote beach. And this is a very sad uh, image of bird that is simply, uh, it, it couldn't find anything else to eat, so he's eating garbage. It didn't, uh, couldn't, couldn't do anything else, of course it's dead. So landfills, that's where 54% of our waste goes. And this is a great picture of a landfill. Um, modern sanitary landfill is designed to contain those wastes, not to let it get out of hand. That refuse compacted, converted daily, covered daily, layer of dirt, decreased smells, discouraged bugs and rats, actually we cover ours with tires. Not the big chunky tires, but shredded tires. We shred all those tires up that we collect on the side of the road. A lot of landfills, uh, class three, which is what the most expensive, the most regulated, and the best ones have actual liners at the bottom of them so that when that uh, uh, fluid inevitably comes through, it is actually treated as waste as uh, uh, they run it through a wastewater treatment plant. Landfills produce a great deal of methane. That CH4 stuff, we learned about that with the Liso Canyon gas leak. They have to manage methane, that greenhouse gas. Organic material inside a landfill decomposes with no oxygen. Use the chemical shorthand for it. Without oxygen, um, that organic matter decomposes to that methane gas. Single largest, one, this is one of those $64 words. I love that word. Anthropogenic means man-made. Could have put man-made up there, but hey, let's expand our knowledge. This is, after all, college. Anthropogenic source of methane in the United States. Globally, land, landfills produce more than 700 million tons of methane every year. That's a lot of methane. About half the landfill gas in the United States is either flared off, burned off, or just burn it, or collected and used for fuel. Uh, we tried that. The problem sometimes with that is that when you have landfill generated methane, it has a lot of other, well, things that won't burn so well, like sulfur and things like that, that tend to uh, do bad things to engines. So you have to clean it first. Um, so it's not a perfect solution, but you know, it's something. And this is what happens to all those old... Anybody ever see these things anymore? CRTs, cathode ray tubes, full of cadmium, chrome, lead. Um, basically, we, well, we still export it, even though most industrialized nations have stopped shipping this stuff to less developed countries. Supposedly we stopped doing it in 1989, but yeah, the practice still continues. Most of the world's obsolete ships are now dismantled and recycled in poor countries. Work is dangerous. And this is, you know, this isn't a picture of a ship, this is a piece of someone taking apart the, an old computer monitor or an old TV monitor. But you can see in the background there's all these other circuit boards and stuff all loaded with heavy metals. But they do it by hand. It's toxic. So e-waste is what we're talking about here. All these nice shiny new computers and all that stuff, um, well, eventually, you know, they become obsolete. So in 1990, there was very little obsolete computers produced in terms of millions of numbers because 1990, yeah, they, we had computers back then. I, I know you hardly believe it, but... Uh, so the numbers have shot up. The, uh, the blue line is in the developed world, and this is a projection. We're about right in here. And we're about at the point where the tons or the millions of computers produced in the developing world is going to pass that in the developed world and continue because their population is going to continue to increase. And everything is, we're, we're going to much more of a mechanized system. The discard electronics, one of the greatest sources of toxic material currently going to developing countries. In that, okay, this says computers, cell phones. Cell phones have those same components. 
heavy metals, toxins, something's going to happen to them. You think they just get thrown in a landfill? Well, maybe they do, but there's recyclable materials in there, uh, if you know how to get them out. So, there is this idea of incineration, which won't work for e-waste, by the way. Many cities use waste incinerators to burn their municipal waste. Most incinerators do some degree of energy recovery. Or you take the stuff, you burn it, using that heat from the incinerated refuse, heating those nearby buildings, produce steam and generate electricity. There's a process, uh, if you ever drive south through the Everglades, um, if you look off in the distance, you'll see these uh, huge factories. This is where they're actually, that's not factory, it's where they're, they're uh, processing uh, sugar cane. Well, they don't, you won't see any electrical power lines running those things because they take the, the, the waste, the, 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 uh, the stubble, if you will, from the field that's not sugar, and they actually burn it and generate their own electricity on site. So that's a good thing, <laughs> matter of fact. Refuse-derived fuel is what's left after unburned recyclable materials are removed. Unburnable, <laughs> unburned, unburnable. So get the computers out of there and burn the rest of it. Uh, another approach is called a mass burn. Okay, well basically you take everything <laughs> and burn it, whether it's a uh, uh, heavy metal, a, a can, or a, a piece of newspaper. Burn as much as possible, dump everything into a giant furnace, unsorted. Mm. Well, here you go. You have uh, this uh, the, the garbage truck there arriving, dumping all that refuse into the bunker, um, and it gets put up into the hopper into the combustion chamber and you can see there's ash coming out the bottom uh, they, they have a boiler they might be generating a little bit of electricity uh, maybe not much uh, and then they're they're trying to get the, the stuff out of the, uh, the the waste stream and then they eventually it all comes out this stack well not all of it the ash that's remaining goes to a landfill that's not the greatest stuff in the world if Big if. They are not well built, managed, maintained. They can produce <clears throat> a lot of ash and a lot of hazardous airborne emissions. That ash is loaded with hazardous stuff. That mass burn contains toxic components. Love these words. Dioxin, furans, lead, cadmium, mercury, zinc, you name it. And those are recyclable materials. The dioxins and the furans aren't. Those are plastics of sorts. Toxic materials contain or are more concentrated in fly ash, and that fly ash, which goes out through the stack, can penetrate very, very small particles, penetrate deep into the lungs. One study, all the, all the incinerators ex exceeded the standards for the metal cadmium. All of them exceeded those standards. 80% exceeded lead standards. So perhaps a mass burn incinerator is not the best way to go. Get that stuff out of there. Don't just burn it. So, how do we shrink this waste stream? Landfills, incineration, recycling saves money, energy, raw materials, land, space, and pollution. So, recycling, re reuse, reduce, recycle. Recycling is the process. Take those discarded products and turn them into new ones. You can remake those things. Old aluminum cans. Don't throw away an aluminum can. That's my mantra. <laughs> Recycle those things because you can turn those aluminum cans directly into new cans. Glass bottles, it's not working quite so well for us there. I wish it were. Um, alternately, you can make new products from the old. Old tires are shredded and turned into playground material or road surfacing or cover for landfills. I got a plane. Nice, big old plane. So, uh, how many? Let's just do some, some numbers here. Some dramatic successes in recycling in recent years. Nationally, we here in the United States recycle or compost a third of all of our municipal solid waste. Okay, hey, that's good. Aluminum is probably the easiest and most valuable material to recycle. But only half, half throw, throw an aluminum can away, recycle it. Only half the aluminum cans are recycled in the United States. We still throw away nearly 350,000 metric tons of aluminum cans, enough to make 3,800 of these bad boys here. 
they don't make 747s anymore, but that's that's the image. That's that's a lot of a lot of aluminum, a lot of airplane. A lot of the problem is commodity markets aren't stable. You can't always be guaranteed to get the same amount of money from day to day. So it's challenging developing that market because it's all about marketing because you can't make a living if you can't sell your product. Yeah. So, how do other countries dispose of their wastes? Well, there's a nice list there. In Germany, about, what percentage is that? Say 42%, no, 38% of their waste is incinerated. The rest is recycled. Uh, Sweden, a larger percentage on the uh, uh, incinerated recycling. What I find interesting is, is the United Kingdom. I presume this just means uh, Great Britain, the British Isles. But look at all that landfill space they're taking up. They have more than 50% or about 50% of their solid waste is put into landfills. Uh, with the smaller amounts are uh, incinerated and composted. We already talked about us. We're at 54%. We're the world leader in composting, at least among the developed world on this graph. <laughs> we're a leader in actually dumping our waste in, in the ground in landfills. And, uh, well, back to Kirstenstad, Sweden. They actually, out on the street, they have separate bins for food waste. Which one is food? I can't tell. I, I don't read Swedish. Food waste and other recyclables. So you go along the sidewalk, you've, you're, you're done with your, your uh, uh, you went to McDonald's, they don't have McDonald's, I'm sure they have something fancier than McDonald's, but anyway, you're walking along and, and you have what's left over is, is a, uh, your, your, uh, uh, the, the paper, and you put the paper in one bin, and suppose you didn't eat all your burnt, you put the rest of that in a, a food container, a waste container. And so those things, they're provided for use by pedestrians. So, you keep the two waste streams, as long as everybody participates, you keep the two waste streams pure, and it's easy for people to participate in it. But then you've got to sort it out. So, what do we recycle the most? And this is... <laughs> we recycle, actually, this is great, 100% of car batteries. Why do we... Why is almost... Okay, it's 99%, whatever that is. Why do we recycle so many car batteries? Because... You pay a fee up front when you buy that battery. It's like five bucks. And when you take that battery back to wherever you bought it from, they will charge you another five bucks unless you turn in that battery. So it's five bucks off the cost of your battery. And it's, it's easy. And batteries are hard to get rid of. So we recycle a lot of steel cans. Uh, yard waste. That's interesting. There's a lot more yard trimmings recycled. That's over 60%. Um, Soft drink cans, beer cans, about, uh, say, not quite 50%. Need to better on that. Uh, tires, not very good at that. Glass containers, uh, the market is falling for that. It's about 25%. So, it does save money, energy, and space. Curtside recycling, well, where it's well developed, costs about $35 a, a ton. Um, $80 a ton, paid to dispose at an average metropolitan landfill. I have to say those costs are a little higher than you find in rural areas. That's why the city of Avon Park takes their municipal solid waste to another county to dispose of it because it's like $35 or $30 a ton they're being charged for it. It's all about money. Recycling lowers that demand for raw resources. We talked about this way back many lectures ago. It's been a long term, hasn't it? Recycling also reduces energy consumption and air pollution. And making that new steel from old scrap, 75% energy savings. It takes a lot less energy to reduce, to simply take that aluminum can, don't throw aluminum cans away, uh, and, and recycle it. Producing aluminum from scrap instead of bauxite ore cuts that energy use by 95%. It's a simple thing. So you want to keep materials out of landfills. All this, I think this came probably, well, it's obviously compressed cardboard, uh, but you can take and turn that right back into paper. Uh, often that composting will recycle those organic wastes. Landfill space, many cities have banned yard waste from municipal garbage. Well, yard waste, like, like 
like uh, leaves and tree limbs, takes up a huge amount of space. Rather valuable organic material. They will basically will compost it, and then, well, composting, you, you take the organic matter, you degrade it under organic conditions, which does not, or aerobic, I'm sorry, or aerobic oxygen conditions, which basically uh, prevents the formation of things like methane. Uh, organic compost, nutrient-rich soil amendment, and it's actually a product that uh, you can sell back to the people, or actually if you're a part of that city, I think in places they'll actually give it away. It's good stuff. So here's a picture of a guy uh, out recycling, composting, yeah, move on. Reuse is even better than recycling. That's, that's el numero uno, if I can use a foreign language here. Um, of the three R's, reuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle, reducing is better than recycling. Because basically, you clean and reuse materials in a present form, you save the cost of energy and remaking them to something else. You know, we can reuse all kinds of things. We routinely reuse auto parts, clean them up a little bit, but yeah, that's where I get new mirrors for my old truck. Well, they're not new, they're reused. Stained glass windows, brass fittings, all this stuff old houses are reused in construction, although not as often as perhaps they should be. Some communities sort and reuse a variety of materials that are received in their dumps. Reducing waste, not generating, is always cheaper. It's always cheaper not to produce the stuff in the first place. Uh, recycling is good. Slowing that consumption of throwaway products is a lot better. Really take take that uh, okay you you know I I'll do this although I'll be aware after a bit um, I get a cup of coffee at McDonald's I will drink that uh, out of the cup of coffee then I'll take it and I'll rinse it out and I keep it it's, it's paper but I reuse it I can reuse that for for four or five maybe ten cups uh, of coffee so it's better than buying a new one all the time industries are increasingly finding that reducing just reducing the volume saves money. Those aluminum cans are getting easier and easier to crush <laughs> because you don't need to use as much aluminum as you did, or they did, 20 years ago. This excessive packaging of food and consumer products is one of those greatest sources of unnecessary waste. McDonald's back, well, a while ago, they don't do it anymore, but they used to take their, uh, you, you get a Big Mac, they wrap it in a, a piece of, of wax paper or whatever that paper stuff is. And then they put that inside a card, a, a, either a cardboard or styrofoam box, and then they would put that box inside a paper bag. Well, and then they, they then you'd go to the, the table and sit down and you'd unpack the whole thing and all this waste. Well, they stopped doing that. They just, I think they just used the, uh, uh, put the Big Mac in the waste, uh, the, the uh, wax paper. Disposable packaging is necessary, we can reduce the waste by using biodegradable materials, not those nice plastic containers. And this is just like, really? The dude's trying to recycle and consume more, buy more, use it and throw it away. That's the message that we get. Reducing waste is the cheapest option. Don't buy it in the first place. And we get into something that's a little bit different. This is a, I think that's a mercury sniffer he's got in his hand there, or she's got, I can't tell. Um, anyway, hazardous and toxic waste. Most dangerous aspect of the waste stream has toxic tox, toxins in it. <laughs> Injurious to us, the environment, those animals around us. What produces the most hazardous waste? Well, those chemical and petroleum industries, all that uh, stuff that is dug out of the ground. Certainly mineral mining and processing is somewhat of a problem, but it's the petroleum industry, really. So what is hazardous waste? Legally, hazardous waste is any discarded material, liquid or solid, contained substances that are known to be the following, oops, fatal, <laughs> to laboratory animals or humans in low doses, Toxic, carcinogenic, mutagenic, there's a new one, teratogenic, meaning it forms birth defects in uh, developing fetuses. Humans or other life forms, 
ignitable. It can burn at a fairly low temperature. Uh, flashpoint less than 60 degrees uh, centigrade means it's going to burn if it gets uh, near a match. Corrosive, explosive, or highly reactive. Now, corrosive you get, you know, acid. Highly reactive, there's this stuff called sodium hydroxide that is used in, well, um, cleaners. And when that stuff starts bubbling and all that, hey, it looks great. Well, what it is is it's in undergoing a violent chemical reaction to help it uh, clean things. That's a corrosive material, and we use lots of it. And it is a hazardous waste if just disposed of as waste. So we obviously have to have regulations because, you know, that's the way it is. There are two important federal laws that regulate waste management and disposal in the U.S. RICRA. I like RICRA because it kind of rolls off your tongue. It was originally passed in 1976. And the this one has a really long name. Call it Superfund. Superfund is actually the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act of 1980. Uh, modified 1984 to make it even more pronounceable called SARA either Superfund or Sarah, Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act. I used to live in this world. I have to deal with, deal with these things. I'm so happy that somebody else does it. Basically, we have this rapid containment, cleanup, and remediation of abandoned toxic waste sites. I, the word rapid in there just kind of boggles my mind because it's not very rapid. So, you start out, this is the waste treatment facility, and you have to track this stuff. Um, has this waste generator, ships it to the treatment facility. The treatment facility transports it to a secure landfill. Secure landfill uh, takes the paperwork, this is the waste stays here. The paperwork then goes back to both the generator and to your local regulator. And there are things called Superfund sites. Eventually we're going to get around to cleaning them up. Superfund or revolving pool of money has a certain designation. Provides an immediate response, once again, that word immediate, uh, response to emergency situations that pose imminent hazards. I guess, okay, looking at, we talked about uh, uh, Eliso Canyon, we talked about uh, the, uh, the abandoned uh, uh, mine in uh, New Mexico that was uh, dumping all that waste. That would be an immediate response to an emergency situation. Okay, there's money to do that with. Clean up or remediate abandoned or inactive sites. And, there may be over 400,000 Superfund sites in the U.S., and there may be new ones generated by that first one, immediate response to emergency situations. Total cost for hazardous waste cleanup in the United States is between, if we actually do it, $370 billion and $1.7 trillion. It's like an industry. It's a lot of money. So this is a guy rolling a barrel at a uh, uh, toxic waste disposal site, uh, well uh, uh, muddied up there. And this is a concerning and disturbing uh, image, if you will. The hazardous waste sites, all these purple dots here, and you can see them all over the place, particularly those here in Florida, uh, are all, every one of them that we have, we have a hazardous waste site, it's going to be near our drinking water aquifers. So we really need to be very careful about how well we manage these things. Very few actually are out here in the West where the drinking water aquifers aren't quite... I'm not saying we need to move all our waste out there. I'm just saying that um, it seems odd that even up in this part of the world, we don't have a lot of hazardous waste dumps. It's a brownfield. Well... Many cities, large areas of contaminated properties are known as brownfields because you can't do anything with them. They're abandoned, not being used because they have real or potential suspected pollution. Up to a third of all commercial industrial sites in the urban core of many big cities fall into this category. Hard to find buyers. I mean, if you're going to buy this property, you got to redevelop a place that may cost you millions of dollars to clean up waste you didn't create. That's hard. So they've created brownfield areas where you don't have to actually clean up, you just have to cap it and leave it in place. But you do have to, if you're going to remove that hazardous waste, you have to process it, store it permanently. What are you going to do with all this toxic hazardous waste? 
our homes, we can reduce that generation, choose less toxic materials, uh, use uh, 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 sodium hydroxide or uh, uh, something like use of um, uh, other other materials. I don't know what that was. It just went out of my mind. Uh, Buy what you need for a job at hand. Use the last little bit or share the leftovers with a friend or neighbor. Don't just leave it in the containers. Common materials you probably already have will make excellent alternatives to commercial products. So let's produce less waste. Safest and least expensive way to avoid hazard waste problems. Don't create it in the first place. Excuse me. Manufacturing processes can be modified to reduce or eliminate that waste production. More efficiency. Frequently found that new processes not only spare the environment, but also save money by using less energy and fewer raw materials. You can also convert to less hazardous substances. Several processes available to make hazardous material less toxic. Physical treatments that bind this stuff up. Incineration. It can apply to a mixture of waste. It's a permanent solution to many problems, quick and relatively easy, but you have to deal with the, the ash that's left over and cleaning up the gas that goes out the stack and make sure all that stuff is contained. Chemical processing. You can take the materials and make them non-toxic. You can neutralize waste by putting a, 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 something in to buffer that acid or that uh, caustic material together. You can remove metals, and in a recycling system, you can actually remove those halogen uh, halogens that are uh, usable in other processes. And then the process of actually oxidizing something to remove its toxic compare, uh, components. Um, has this waste site, permanently stored. That looks sort of haphazard, but I don't think it is. It's well regulated. So this is a permanent storage facility. Uh, remember, I was talking earlier about Class 3 landfills. This is way beyond that uh, because this has got a permanent solid cap. Uh, clay, sand, gravel, uh, existing clay. they got monitoring drains. Um, inevitably, some materials we can't, like all that ash that's generated from the uh, mass burn plants, has to go someplace to be stored permanently, out of harm's way. So we're just going to sit there and we're going to know about it. Um, that permanent removal involves placing waste storage basically in a cavern like this. Um, be inspected periodically, retrieved if necessary. I hope you don't have to go in there and retrieve that. Secure landfills, the most popular solutions, are very expensive. And newer techniques make it possible to create safe, modern, secure landfills that contain hazardous wastes. As long as we don't want it in our backyards. We produce a lot of waste. We can, we know that. Government policies and economics of scale made it cheaper and more convenient to extract that raw virgin material rather than reuse or recycle those items. Economies of scale. It's easier, cheaper, but is that really, going back to that quote, is that the reality? Yeah. Rising costs, declining availability of landfills has led to new creative strategies that will reduce, reuse, and recycle, making us more aware of that. We've got to pay attention to recycling, reusing, reducing that waste. It's going to greatly improve our awareness and reducing, reduce our environmental liabilities. So, talked about our waste stream. It's not uh, a stream that uh, uh, goes into a lake around here, I hope. Uh, sanitary landfills and other alternatives to them, like burning. Why is ocean dumping still a problem? Well, you saw. Those pictures are, <laughs> images are, are incredibly disturbing. Three R's of waste reduction. Big R, most important, is reuse. Trust me, that's what that says. Turning biomass waste into natural gas. Doing that in that town in Sweden. Toxic and hazardous waste. How do we dispose of them carefully? <laughs> We're doing some bioremediation and Superfund. What is it and has it done any good? And those are the references for this particular lecture.